Massive shout out to Ryan of the Ride the Lightning podcast, possibly the longest running and definitely one of the OG Tesla podcasts. He sat down with Lars, Tesla's VP of engineering, to discuss in particular Tesla Cybercap and their more affordable vehicles. And this interview not only features a lot of confirmation of things we kind of already knew or could surmise, but also a few new tidbits with big implications for Tesla investors. First, will Cybercab be road trip capable? Spoiler alert, yes. How? Wireless charging, which Tesla's already unveiled. The best part about this, by the way, as I mentioned at the time, these wireless chargers can be installed in any existing parking spaces at any existing Tesla supercharger locations and, spoiler alert, any fucking car space on earth, actually. They literally fit in a car space. It's amazing. 400 IQ stuff. So the question of where to charge cybercabs is already answered. I used to ask you a question on Tommy. Why would you have a plug? If I'm on a road trip, what if I want to go to Disneyland and go to sleep? Sure, but like, isn't there a different way to charge? There is. <laughs> if, uh, if you have, but then that's another infrastructure issue. Could be, but um, you know, we were making some smart plays on that, I think, with the new V4. So Cybercab so. will be road trip capable, is what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, we lo- we, you saw it. We have wireless charging, right? Like, it's coming on Cybercab, and I think that's ultimately, like, if you're going to put a bunch of design effort into something, like, why put this really complex moving device to move a cable when you can have no moving parts and just right. have the car go But I guess on a, in a road trip scenario, like, like, Kettleman City is my favorite mm-hmm. supercharger until the drive-in diner opens, which yeah. I'm sure that'll overtake it. But Kettleman City is awesome. It's this cool lounge. I mean, yeah. obviously you've been there. But so do you, do you then, are you just going to invest in installing wireless chargers in, in the parking lots? Yeah, at, I mean, I think that's sort of like the deployment plan that we'll yeah. put out there is like, we don't need them all the places. Right. But like- so uh, there we go, straight from the horse's mouth. I mean, again, we could have figured this out. In fact, I did figure this out. As soon as Tesla unveiled the wireless charging, I see it fitting in a car space. I'm like, this is genius. Because Tesla already has existing sites with existing car spaces for people to supercharge. And just think about the brilliance here. How seamless, how easy, and how inexpensive it will be for Tesla to install these chargers. I'll put on screen now so you guys can see what I'm talking about, right? Cybercab can just back in, drive over this thing, park for a few minutes, and charge. There's no moving parts. There's no fuckery. People can't cut the wires. It's brilliant. And how easy will it be for a hotel? a department store, anywhere with a car space to have one of these installed. It's brilliant. Low capex, low maintenance. And as Lars points out, you don't need anybody to handle a plug. Sounds a bit bit sus. Ryan sounds like he's somewhat attached to the experience at one of the supercharger locations. But any concerns that anyone had, oh, how will you charge a cyber cab? Who will plug it in? Can be put to bed. So I could take my cyber cab. I can just play video games or watch movies the entire or time. Sleep. Yeah, or sleep, and it'll yeah. take me overnight to visit my parents in Phoenix. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's that's, see, that's where it gets. To me, that's almost more interesting than I mean, you autonomy know, when you, when in, you talk the about city. the ubiquitousness of travel that it can offer, it's kind of mind-blowing when you think about it because like, you know, I, I go to LA a lot to be with Franz. You sure. know, I called my partner in crime and could, you know, I'm happy to call him my friend and, you know, when we're going down to the studio, but it's like, you know, 9 times out of 10 we hop, I hop on a plane and it's like I'm fortunate that we can, you know, fund that, but like it's really bad for the carbon footprint yeah. and you know, door to door, it still takes like three and a half hours. True. Because right? you got to get to the airport like an early, hour, yeah. hour and 10 early, and you got to go from the airport to where you're going. And so, in a, you know, like you talked about going to Disneyland, right? Like if you think about a family of four from the Bay Area that want, wants to go to Disneyland, they got to buy four plane tickets. You got to fly to John Wayne. I mean, they we're talking about like, I don't know, it's probably like a, you can go buy tickets to Disneyland. Probably like a $5,000 trip. Oh, easily. Yeah. Right? For a family of four to go. Yeah. On the other hand, you could take Model X that's autonomous down there. From here, and like at a cost of, you know, I don't know, 50 cents a mile or something, you know, a dollar a mile. Like, you know, you're talking maybe now you take that $5,000 trip and you turn it into like a $1,500 trip. Well, you're also selling Model Xs with free lifetime supercharging there right now. Go. So there so, you go. That's an incentive. But, you know, I mean, I'm talking about like, yeah, in the, in, in the autonomous fleet, that's something yeah. that I think like really opens up the economy. Now, this is a massive point one I've raised many times over and one I've not heard a single other person discuss. The solving of autonomy will over time cause a massive disruption to domestic air travel. I made the exact example that Lars has here. When you actually fly domestically, even if the flight itself is a 45 minute, hour, maybe a 90 minute flight, the additional time involved in going from your door, taking a taxi, an Uber, or some form of public transport to the airport, arriving early enough to get through security, to get to your boarding gate, to wait, and then for the flight to be delayed, and get on the tarmac and for also to be delayed, then you fly, you land, you collect your baggage, blah, blah, blah. By the time you actually get to your destination, it can easily take two, three plus times, maybe even four times as much as the actual flight time itself just to get to where you were going. 
You pay a massive price premium for this. And good luck trying to get work done. If you're trying to be productive through this whole process, stop, start, up, down. You might be able to whip your laptop out briefly on the plane. Absolute pain in the ass and no privacy. Contrast that. We're taking an autonomous vehicle door to door with just you and all your family. Let's say you needed to get some work done. Whip out your laptop. Three, four, five hours later, you've arrived at your destination. Maybe it took a little bit longer than a plane. Maybe not. You get half a day of work done on the way. Or catch up on your favorite series on Netflix. Or farm some runes in your favorite video game. I don't think people fully appreciate the massive disruption that's going to happen off domestic flight with autonomy. Never mind the overnight scenario. Need to head somewhere? Why don't you do a red-eye cyber cab? It picks you up sometime close to midnight. You go to sleep, you wake up in the morning at your destination. Completely refreshed. It's going to be massive. And now this, at least to me, was a bombshell. We know cyber cab is going to be extremely fast to produce and going to be produced at a very low cost. But check this out. No paint shop. I thought for sure when the cyber cab would be a little stainless steel car because it'd be super tough. Anybody could beat up on it. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's just surprising to me that, that you guys de- spent so much time and effort developing this alloy yeah. well, and don't have any current plans to use it in anything else. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to remember about HFS is like it's really hard to form and bend, right? Like stainless aside, stainless we could, we might be able, and might use in the future, but it, you know, hard freaking stainless, like it's only going to have that cyber shape. Yeah. Like, we cannot... I mean, it takes a ton there's no of effort. Curves. To, yeah, there's no, no curves. curves are coming to that party. And so, like, when you think about the aerodynamic requirements of of something as efficient as CyberCab, like, it, it didn't marry. But that doesn't to say CyberCab is painted. Uh, okay, hold on. Well, hold on. It's it's a gold color that's yeah. an homage per France to New York City cabs. Yep. If it's not paint, what is it? Well, I mean, we are developing a new process um, that, that has been in, the, in various industries for a while where you inject the, actually the PU, the polyurethane paint, at the same time that you make the plastic panels. And so like yeah. that, like there's no paint shop in that vehicle either. It's just, we put the color in when we make the panels, that's it. That's no or- cool. No orange peel, no, uh, no bleed. But then when you, if you want to repair it, cause like you get scratch or whatever, it's, it's basically paint. Huh, so can, can I order my cyber cab in a variety of colors or? W- well, currently we only plan on the one, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess in theory we could, inject whatever color you wanted yeah now this is massive the cost time and even the factory footprint which is enormous associated with a paint shop is in stark contrast to everything cybercab is about low cost to produce fast to produce able to be produced from a small factory footprint i was wondering about this and now we have the answer no paint another big brain flex from tesla that quote we're developing a new process words that should instill fear into all legacy automotive manufacturers this is another very clear sign that Tesla's overall cost to produce and the speed at which they can produce CyberCab is going to be a dramatic leap forward. And even if you don't know shit about automotive manufacturing, let's just imagine we're talking about paint. Would having to paint something during the process of putting it together take a little bit of time? I mean, yeah, think about it. Now, before we get any further, I do actually want to remind you guys once again that before the CyberCab enters volume production, Tesla will be introducing more than one new affordable vehicle which implements some of the manufacturing techniques, some of the innovations, some of the learnings from CyberCab to reduce the cost for consumers to purchase a compelling Tesla vehicle. The most we've heard on these so far are words to the effect of new, more affordable vehicles, plural. So there's at least two, maybe more. I strongly suspect that we're going to see both an SUV and a sedan. And in essence, you can think of them as a watered down version of today's recently refreshed Model 3 and Model Y which continue to creep further and further and further toward a pure luxury, super high-end vehicle. A lot of bells and whistles that make the experience excellent, but are far beyond what somebody on a budget needs or is willing to pay for. There's currently a lot of speculation from people who are under the impression that Tesla will actually release a cybercab to sell to the general public with a steering wheel. I wouldn't count on that, but it's certain that these more affordable vehicles, which, ready for it, enter production this year, will feature a lot of the manufacturing innovations to drive costs down that we'll eventually see in the CyberCab. And speaking of these more affordable Tesla vehicles, again, entering production this year. Like four months-ish? Yeah. Um, I, what's a good little factoid? Something that won't get you fired or in trouble, but... Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think the, the most kind of difficult part of doing that is like not making the cars worse. And so I promise that they won't, like, you know, they won't be a massive step down from where the cars we sell today. That's a great answer. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's all the time we have. Yeah, my phone's Lars blowing Moravi, up. <laughs> VP. Well, thank you, Captain Obvious. Now, trolling aside, I mean, 
No shit, Sherlock. Tesla won't release a piece of shit. It's just not in their DNA. Their new, more affordable vehicles will absolutely annihilate anything for a comparable price point. But we have to be honest here. Today's Model 3 and Model Y have so many unnecessary luxuries. The big limiting factor for Tesla selling many millions of additional vehicles per year is how much they cost. In short, Tesla's goal with these is so obvious. One, make them as safe as possible. Two, make an absolutely incredible vehicle that offers exceptional value that many more people can afford. The recently refreshed Model Y features an epic, badass light bar. Is that necessary? Absolutely not. Delete. Greatly improved suspension. Probably not necessary. Delete. A completely over-the-top sound system. Delete. Now, I'm not saying it's going to sound like dog shit in these refreshed vehicles, right? But there's definitely some money to be saved there as well. What about the RGB lighting strip in the interior? Delete. Ventilated front seats. Delete. I mean, hey, they'd be nice to have. Maybe one or two of these features will appear in the new vehicles. But the whole point with Tesla here, if you want those features, spend 40, 45,000 bucks and get a 3 or Y refresh. If you can't afford those, you still want a Tesla, you want a really compelling vehicle, Tesla's just going to delete a bunch of shit that is totally unnecessary but nice to have. Save thousands of dollars and introduce products that many more people can afford. Do you need powered rear seats? No. Delete. How about a rear touchscreen? No. Delete. What about acoustic glass? No. Delete. If Tesla can save just 15% on purchase price, I mean, I suspect they'll be aiming for much more, but even just 15% is going to unlock a few million vehicles per year of additional total addressable market that people can actually afford to act on. Everyone wants a Tesla, but not everyone can afford one. My strong suspicion is that these refreshed vehicles will be a little bit smaller and therefore a little bit less massive and therefore require a little bit less battery pack for comparable range, have a bunch of these high-end features stripped out, but still be incredibly safe, high-performance, efficient, advanced, brilliant vehicles that just destroy everything else anywhere near the same price point. And as Lars points out, they're not going to be shit. They're going to be extremely compelling a little bit more affordable and destroy everything else even close to the same price. And again, they enter production this year. Want more content? Early access? Bunch of perks? Click the links in the pinned comment. AG1 is awesome. I've been taking it daily now for more than three years. It's a great way to fill in nutritional gaps. It's packed full of vitamins, minerals, and whole food source nutrients. Plus, has prebiotics, probiotics, and adaptogens to improve gut health, regularity, and help your body handle stress. I'm always looking for an edge to help me feel and perform my best, which is why I haven't missed a day of AG1 for more than three years. Just try it and see how you feel. Click the link in the pinned comment or head to drinkag1.com slash SMR and get yourself a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five travel packs. This is what viewers of the channel had to say after trying AG1. I feel like I have a lot more energy since I started on AG1. Just got my AG1 in the mail. Legit feeling the effects after day three. Three months ago, I started AG1 and have been enjoying the evenness of alertness and energy that lasts the day. I just started the wife on it too. Are you convinced yet? I mean, hey, it's worth trying, right? Click the link in the pin comment or head to drinkag1.com slash SMR or I can keep going. This viewer after about a month on AG1, definitely a lack of fatigue in the afternoon. Pleasant side effect is that my coffee intake has imploded and is almost down to zero. One more. Yeah, why not? I honestly feel younger and will be continuing to use AG1. This stuff really is crazy good. I didn't think it would be, but this stuff is awesome. It really is what everyone is saying. One more. Don't mind if I do. I've just received my third month supply. I've drank it every day. I have so much energy throughout most of the day. I'm productive, started a new business, started socializing, refurbished a boat. It's no coincidence. Thank you for your persistence, your integrity, and your insights. Now look, these are not my words. These are not my testimonials. This is what you guys and girls are saying. Maybe it's 100% placebo effect, but even if that's the case, I think it's money well spent. Click the link in the pinned comment or head to drinkag1.com slash SMR and get yourself a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five travel packs.